we uh, are, are performing. So for this first half of the lecture, I want to discuss the models that uh, we can use to describe the universe. The, again, the linear matter, matter power spectrum that uh, we, uh, you know, Mustafa gave an incredible lecture on the uh, linear power spectrum. This is amazing. And then I talked about the challenges, uh, the nonlinear modeling of the matter power spectrum, what happens with baryons, something that Mustafa asked already, and the connection between dark matter or matter in the universe and galaxies. Okay? Those are the big challenges that we face, among others, but I think those are the biggest ones, and they're mainly theoretical challenges. So, models of the universe. You know, we want to compute the evolution of perturbations, but in order to do that, you have to give me a model, right? What is the model that you want to compute the growth of the linear perturbations? The, growth of linear, the linear growth of perturbations depend on the model of the universe. Okay, so which model will you choose? It's up to you. You choose whatever model you want to test. That's our job, test models. So what is the simplest model that we can test? This is the standard cosmological model. It's a spatially flat lambda CDM model. And this is the bread and butter of the experiments, right? This is the first thing we want to do, is to test the standard model. If we find some failure in the standard model in explaining the data, then we have motivations to go to more complex models and try to understand better what is the nature of dark energy and dark matter, things that we don't know yet. So sorry to break the nails for you, <laughs> but so far, we have not found any consistent deviations of, um, from the standard cosmological model, except for this Hubble tension that maybe we'll talk about sometime <laughs> in the discussion sessions. But so far, the lambda CDM model, the flat lambda CDM model works very well. And it is, it is characterized by some cosmological parameters, which we already, we already saw a little bit. So this is the, uh, these two, parameters here, the amplitude of the initial power spectrum, this spectral slope of the initial power spectrum, these are two parameters that are related to the initial perturbations. So these are parameters um, that, uh, that can test inflationary models, by the way. Inflationary models can predict this type, these two parameters, which characterizes the initial linear power spectrum. Then the Hubble constant, the amount of matter, the amount of baryons, and the amount of neutrinos. Those are the uh, six cosmological parameters. This is the simplest possible model, and this is the first thing you have to do, right? This is the first thing our experiments, our observation and um, um, surveys test. This is the first thing. What is the next to simplest model? The next to simplest model is what is called a WCDM model. So what is a WCDM model? It's a model where the dark energy is not really a cosmological constant, but it is something that has a constant equation of state W. So W is, I, I think I mentioned, and for other people mentioned too, that W is the ratio between the pressure and the energy density for dark energy. Right, so what is W for lambda CDM? Minus one. So lambda, no, in the lambda CDM model, W is minus one, right? So one thing you can do, the, sim the next simplest model to test is to let w, the, the equation of state of dark energy to vary, but again, as a constant, right? You, you let it as a free parameter, but not varying with time. Is that clear? This is the next simplest thing. And uh, <laughs> I never forget, I have to tell you something, I never forget this because uh, 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 when we were doing the first year analysis of the dark energy survey, um, we did, of course, we do analysis blindly, so we don't know what the results are going to be. And then there's a lack like, of a ceremony where we unblind the analysis and see what the results are. So, of course, first we did the, the uh, lambda CDM, but then we also did WCDM in the standard paper. 
then we, we, when, we, when we unblinded the analysis, W for this sim next to simplest model was very close to minus one. And the reaction of Scott Doddleson was uh, the uh, coordinator of the analysis. The, the reaction was this, there goes the Nobel Prize. <laughs> I can never, <laughs> never forget that. There goes the Nobel Prize, W minus one. It's like the standard model in particle physics, right? You go to all these like, uh, talks of LHC results, blah, 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 the standard model works perfectly. So we are more or less in this situation in cosmology where the standard cosmological model is working. Um, so, but we, 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 we are testing, that's, that's what we have to do. So what is the next to next simplest model? The next to next simplest model is to assume an equation of state that varies with time. How does it vary with, how does it vary with time? We don't know, but again, in this next to next simplest model, there is a parametrization of the uh, variation of the equation of state with time. Here I put the scale, scale factor A. And this is a parameterization where W of A, so the equation of state as a function of the scale factor goes like a constant W0 plus one minus A times another constant W A. So there are two free parameters here, W0 and W A. So that's the next to next simplest model. And we also test this type of models in surveys, large-scale surveys, also in CMB, etc. cetera. Uh, and there are many more, many other models that you can do with more parameters. So every time you have more complexity in the model, you have more parameters. Um, one thing you may ask, and I'm not sure I have the answer, is the following. These are just parameterizations of the equation of state. Do you know any model, physical model of dark energy that gives you this? And my answer for this is no, I don't. I don't. Maybe Mustafa knows. I don't. <laughs> it's a Taylor expansion. It's a way of, of seeing if the equation of state changes. It's a way of seeing whether or not dark energy is a cosmological constant. And this is the way to do it, okay? But uh, so this is what we are doing. And uh, it's a very phenomenological approach. You can do other things. You can take a scalar field model for dark energy, and you can ask uh, uh, Julien to put it in class <laughs> and solve the equations to find the linear power spectrum. I'm sure he has done that and see what happens. But then it's a more complicated thing and uh, also interesting to do. Okay? It's also interesting to do. But what I'm telling you is what we do in practice in our large-scale survey at data analysis, that's what we do. Those are the models we test, the first models that we test. We also test whether or not uh, there's some curvature in the universe, so there's things like that that we can test. We also test some more effects of uh, masses of neutrinos, etc. But this is, this is the bread and butter that we do. Okay, so this is the uh, uh, models of the universe that uh, we choose to analyze. Yes? So we don't do state finder. Uh, we just, uh, it's really very simple. We just put this uh, uh, next, next uh, uh, simplest model, next to next simplest model in uh, one of uh, Boltzmann solver and find the linear power spectrum and, uh, and start from there. So we don't do state finding. Um, because in the end, what, uh, what we need to do is to compare our, our data with theoretical predictions and estimate the parameters using some statistical technique called Markov chain Monte Carlo. So you have to have your parameters very well defined and uh, it has to be quick. Otherwise, you know, these things don't uh, take, a, take a long time to analyze. Uh, yes, yes. You can have any model you want, any model you want. That's why I say there are many other models with more parameters. Different uh, models for dark matter. Mustafa is the expert, he'll tell all about it. We have not tested them in the dark energy survey. And uh, I will explain why. Um, and this is, this is in the challenge issues here. So just to make a long story short, 
Mustafa showed the plot of the uh, linear power spectrum, and the, uh, he says that uh, you know, whatever model for dark matter you have, you must agree with the linear power spectrum because that's where you have measured, and you have not measured the other part, so there's some freedom. This is not, this, there's a challenge there because we have measured the power spectrum in those scales. The problem is that we don't know, we don't control theoretically other things, uh, not only <laughs> the issue with dark matter, but this baryonic and nonlinear galaxy clustering. So that's where the challenge is. Once we have a very solid theoretical control of the power spectrum at nonlinear scales, then we can test uh, this type of models. And I would love to do that, because we, what we actually do, you know what we do with all this data that we cannot model? Guess what we do? We throw them away. We throw data away. It's called scale cuts. We, that's just, we have the data. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> because we don't know how to deal with this, you know? So you have to trust your theory. So it's, it's a theoretical challenge. Of course. Yes. Yes. Instead of the result of the parameters, you use a new species because you are thinking of using testing this model with the next. Yes, yes, absolutely. So for me, sorry to say, <laughs> ionization, the depth is not a cosmological parameter. <laughs> Okay, this is uh, just to provoke. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> optical depth is an uh, astrophysical parameter. Very important, but astrophysical parameter. And uh, also, just to tell you something I tell next time, next, the last lecture, is, okay, so you only, you only have six, six parameters. Easy, no? Just estimate them, get the data. Well, there are <laughs> then there are, there are parameters that enter to parameterize our ignorance on how to deal with uh, uncertainties in the data. And those parameters are very annoying, very annoying. And they're, call, they're called nuisance parameters. They're so annoying that they're called nuisance parameters. Because we need them to parameterize our ignorance on redshift determination. I'll talk about this next time, not today. So in the end, we have uh, six cosmological parameters and 30 nuisance parameters that we have to deal with. I'm sure other experiments like LIGO have the same problems, but uh, maybe less than us. So I'm going to talk about the experiments more next, uh, tomorrow. Yes, more questions. Okay, so we are going to progress slowly. So we talked about the linear matter power spectrum. And uh, so in order to find a realistic uh, uh, matter or radiation power spectrum, you have to use a Boltzmann solver code, uh, like uh, the one that Julian has developed, and that will connect you, that will connect the initial perturbations to something, I put in quotation marks because, of course, Julian told us that sometimes you cannot factorize the growth function with the transfer function. Anyways, there's a way to connect the initial perturbations to the perturbations we see at a later time, and the most used codes are uh, class and, and cam. And uh, so what I, I prepared some, uh, I, I, then I'll share with you some Google Collab notebooks that uses something called the Core Cosmology Library. So that's very interesting uh, thing that the uh, Dark Energy Science Collaboration Desk of the Legacy Service, so I'm going to talk about the Legacy Service space sometime shortly. But uh, uh, they have prepared this uh, Core Cosmology Library to do all kinds of plots and uh, analysis, etc. And uh, I, I, I do some Google Collab notebook and that you can use um, very easily to, to plot some of these things I show here. But anyways, there's a way to connect uh, the initial uh, perturbations to the final perturbations. So this is an, just an example of the uh, core cosmology library, CCL. And uh, you find this in the notebook uh, I send you. So you just say CCL. So cosmical CCL dot cosmology. So you put some parameters of your model. Uh, so omega matter, omega baryon, age, AS, and then S. There's some transfer function. And you say plot the spectrum, boom, you plot the spectrum. So that's 
one line. <laughs> so that's very easy to, uh, to do. Okay. Then this is the linear power spectrum, as you can see. Okay. Good. So now the linear power spectrum, as we discussed uh, here, is a good approximation if the perturbations are small, so that you can use linearized um, per perturbations. And uh, for CMB, these perturbations are very small, 10 to the minus 5. Mm -hmm. And Julian is happy because uh, you know, he can do linearized perturbation theory, and that's it. So uh, <laughs> for CMB, you don't need to go beyond linear perturbation theory. Okay. Now, <laughs> the problem is that if you want to study what happens after the CMB, and what happens after the CMB is that the perturbations grow and grow and grow, <laughs> and we are here thanks to the perturbations growing. <laughs> so the power spectrum, the linear power spectrum is not valid when perturbations, when you want to look at perturbations at, at uh, late times. And this, uh, so with this, it comes the uh, three main challenges to model the power spectrum at late times. The first one is exactly this, that we linearize the equations of perturbations from general relativity. That's an approximation. How do you go beyond the linear approximation in general relativity? So how do, how do, you, how do you take into account nonlinear effects in general relativity? That's very complicated. Then, there are other, uh, uh, another issue that's important is that, you know, this thing, you know, yes, yes, yes. Let me give a, let me give a question, the, the answer. Yes. Uh, that's a question. Yes. The linear power spectrum yes. cannot be responded. Uh, maybe the, the angular two-point relation can show. So the angular two-point, so I'm, we are going to talk a lot about the angular two-point correlation function or the angular power spectrum tomorrow, because in the dark energy survey and LSST, we do exactly that. We analyze that. And that's a projection of the power spectrum in 2D. So the initial, the initial thing that you need is the, power, the 3D power spectrum. Then you project. So this issue appears there as well. No way. You have to. There will be a problem there as well. OK? Good. Thank you. Then there's a problem with baryon physics, that uh, 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 baryons are, I'll explain why, baryons are a nuisance as well. And then this thing of connection between dark matter and galaxies, because we don't see dark matter. So this is the power spectrum for dark matter, but we don't see dark matter. We measure galaxies. How can you measure then the power spectrum of dark matter? We cannot. So, uh, so what is the relation between dark matter? I think these questions came up. Uh, before, Mustafa was telling me that you're asking these questions. It's very good that you're asking these questions because those are very important questions, OK? So what is the connection between dark matter and galaxies? So this is something we have to address it's because we're observing galaxies, not dark matter. So what I will do here, I will really briefly touch on these challenges. I will show some references to some tools that people have developed to deal with these challenges. And I'm sure that uh, next week uh, we have le fantastic lectures by Marco Simonovic, Matias Odariaga, Kora Dvorkin, and uh, they will clear up everything for you. <laughs> and I will not be here, <laughs> so you cannot <laughs> blame me afterwards. Okay. So, right. And then uh, this is something that uh, Mustafa already said, there and you also said, there are many new physics models that result in modifications of the power spectrum at small scales. Dark matter, fuzzy dark matter, this, is this stuff that Mustafa was telling, warm dark matter, modify gravity, etc. So Mustafa is covering all these things. And that's the reason why it is important to understand theoretically the power spectrum at small scales. And, uh, and that's what we I want to show you. How can we do this? So the first challenge that I want to ad address very, very briefly is the nonlinear modeling of matter perturbations. This is a huge, huge subject. So what we have done so far is that we have studied the linearized Newton. I, I have done that. Uh, of course, uh, Julien has done something much more uh, correct <laughs> and sophisticated because I use linearized Newtonian evolution, but he has done in full GR. And Klaas and Cam uh, uh, really 
uh, uses the full generalized, uh, full generativity linearized. But again, as I said, uh, lineariza this linearization approximation breaks down for large perturbations, so small scales, also saw from Mustafa, that uh, the power spectrum is like a variance, so if you go to small scales, you have large variance, so large perturbations, and then the fact that general relativity is highly nonlinear. So there are several approaches that have been developed to study the evolution of perturbations at the nonlinear level, and I'll just mention a few. So uh, it, this is why this lecture is very light. <laughs> so the, uh, this is a very extensive talk, topic that I'm sure will be addressed next week. So I'll just mention a few of the, uh, of the um, techniques or, uh, that have been, or approaches that have been invented to deal with this problem. So the first one is, of course, n-body simulations. So we cannot solve GR exactly. So what you do is that you put particles in a box with very, niche, very uh, uh, uniform initial conditions, but with small fluctuations, and then you let it evolve. Those are snapshots of these particles in the box type of simulation. And this is an old thing. This was done by, um, I forgot to put the name, uh, Andrei Kravtsov in, oh. in Chicago. This is already old, and this is only dark matter. So he, each point here is a dark matter cluster of particles. It's not one particle, okay? It's just a dark matter ball, let's say, okay? Just to see what happens. And this is only Newtonian physics. There are, all, there are more sophisticated simulations that uses GR, which is important large scales. But what you see is just amazing. There are movies. You can download movies. I have a movie too, but you can download movies to see this happening, okay? So what is happening is that we start at uh, some late redshift, so the redshift here is 27.36, and then you let this evolve just by the action of Newtonian gravity. That's all there is to this, to it. And you see already some structure forming. Filamentary structures, more concentration of galaxies somewhere, nodes, etc. So this is happening already at the level of only dark matter, no baryons. This is, there is no baryons, only dark matter. And a, and a very simple Newtonian simulation. And amazingly enough, this kind of reproduces what we more or less see in the universe. That's, that's truly incredible. Yes. This is completely exact at the Newtonian level. Well, with Newtonian, we also linearize the Newtonian equations, if you remember, right? So this is the complete thing. There's no approximation here. Yeah, yeah. Right, so there are no black holes, for instance, forming here, right? Right, so this is Newtonian physics. This is just, gra this is Newtonian particles, okay? And they, they don't really, they, they only interact gravitationally, and that's it. They don't fuse, they don't do anything, they just uh, interact gravitationally. And you form these structures. It's amazing to see this happening, okay? So only, only gravity, Newtonian gravity, is capable of, from a very uniform initial condition, so this initial condition with some small fluctuations, to give rise to structure in the universe. And this is, this is, so this is the reason why structure forms in the universe. Basically, it's gravity. It's gravity working, okay? Newtonian gravity does its trick for you. So this is a, uh, this is a whole area of uh, n-body simulations that uh, have been developed with the years. You know, computers have become faster, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's a whole history of people trying to do these numerical simulations to see what happens. And uh, they, they're more and more sophisticated as I, I would I will show, I guess. Okay, any, any more questions? Yes. Yeah. 
How much time do we need to what? To collapse. Well, you have to define what is collapse. And uh, <laughs> it's not uh, easy. So there, there is a, you can think of uh, algorithms to, f to define if a structure has virialized or not virialized. So there are ways of doing this. But this is, you can do this. You can try to find what's called dark matter halos in these simulations and body simulations. There, is a, there, there are algorithms, algorithms to find structures. But you have to, it's not unique, okay? When you say, ah, oh, is there a cluster of, is, is there some structure here that has collapsed to form a cluster? Then you have to define what a cluster is. And then there are uh, algorithms, some, some algorithms are called friends of friends, so you have to define uh, 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 some algorithm where you will take two, two concentration of dark matter and say, oh, these, these guys are together and forming a cluster or not. So there, there, there are these types of definitions that I hope you understand they're not unique. So when you say collapse has formed structures, you have to be more precise, okay? What do you mean by a collapse? What do you mean by a cluster here in this case, or a halo, and things like that? But this is interesting, okay? People, people have done that. So there, there's several ways of looking in this and say, okay, th there's a halo of dark matter that has formed, or several halos, what is the uh, halo distribution? How many halos have formed with, with what mass? This is called the halo mass function. This is very important in some cosmological models. And this comes from simulations. This is, this is very nice, actually. So this, this is a whole subject that uh, people are studying. So more questions? Uh, yes. Yes. Because I'm trying to understand uh, in which in which regime you should uh, uh, I mean address this. Address the address the need to use an array. Well, if there are large velocities, or if you're looking at the Hubble horizon, or something like that, yes. And there are simulations using full general relativity. Yeah. For small scales, it doesn't matter. It's the same. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. Are these hydrodynamical? No, no. So this is pure dark matter. So this is pure Newtonian. This is very simple. Very, and you already, the amazing thing is that this is very simple. This is just Newtonian physics. And you start with some uniform conditions and you see structure forming in this very, very simple case. Okay? So yes. It's, it's taken into account. Ah, taken yeah, yeah. These are commuting boxes. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Yes. All right. So this is the first thing uh, you can try to do, um, and and to get the because then you can measure the nonlinear power spectrum, right? You can measure. You have this proxies for what what is structure, and you can try to measure the power spectrum. So this is a way of doing it. Of course, this is very simple, and that's. Uh, but for dark matter only, this this would be the way to do it. Okay. Is that okay? Correct me if I'm wrong, Julian. Please. <laughs> Your job is to keep me honest. Here. <laughs> so what people have done is to use these uh, anybody simulations to actually fit lambda CDM power spectrum. In this, with these antibody simulations. Not these very simple ones, but, but with more precise simulations. And there's a very uh, used uh, fit, uh, which is already kind of old, which is called halo fit, which is in class also, I suppose, right? Okay, okay. <laughs> so this is, a, 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 um, this is a fit to the power spectrum that comes from simulations. You understand that you have the simulations, you can measure the power spectrum, right? And then you can make a fit. What is a, why is a fit? Because remember, <laughs> that's interesting, because in order to get this evolution, you need to tell what the model is, right? You have to say what the model is. 
So there is a fit to lambda CDM models. What do you mean? What do we? What is meant by that is that is a fit that is valid for parameters of lambda CDM. And this is the halo fit. So it's based, if I'm not mistaken, on 16 simulations, and it's claimed that they have a 5% precision in the power spectrum for k at most one inverse megaparsecs. Okay, and and the ratio between zero and ten. This is halo fit, and it's, it's a lot used. Okay, many, many people use halo fit. Now you show an example of halo fit here. Okay, this is one way of doing it. There's another fit uh, that, that uh, is done, and this is uh, more recent. Um, it's also it's based on a halo model. It's called HM code, and uh, in this uh, they also use for baryons. I talk it, about this later. So this is a code that also has a fit. You give the linear power spectrum, and it spits out the nonlinear power spectrum. Give it. It's been simulations are different in changing all the six parameters. Yeah. So I don't know how they do it. Yes. <laughs> for six parameters, you cannot do it, right? So I, I, I don't know how they did it. Now I'll talk about emulators later, but uh, yes. This was the first, I think this was the first one that uh, people used. So HM code is, uh, 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 uses a halo model, which I can talk more about what the halo model is. And uh, the uh, people that wrote HM code, they claim a 2.5% accuracy across a range of cosmologies uh, up to scales of 10 inverse megaparsecs. Rash is less than two. That's why I'm not the author of any of this, so uh, I'm just saying what they claim, okay? <laughs> um, and the, you can use HM code as well, some people have done it. And also, more recently, there is a... a <laughs> because you want to do this uh, not only for lambda CDM, you want to do for different types of models. And there is a framework to do this, uh, which is called React, that has been developed in the recent years. And this is also a halo model, uh, which, and the, it's a reaction to non lambda CDM cosmologies. Okay, this is also something that uh, is being developed uh, recently. So this is a way um, to explore the non linear power spectrum for, for non lambda CDM models. This is, this is one thing, but again, it's only for um, uh, only for dark matter. Okay, the, the non linear part of the dark matter. Now. Usually, these n-body simulations take a long time. It's a very computer intensive. So what has been also developed uh, in the last, I don't know, 10 years or so, are fast n-body simulations. And uh, one that's very uh, used these days is called COLA, which stands for Co-Moving Lagrangian Acceleration, which was a method developed, among others, by Matias Odariaga, who will be here next week, so you can ask him about COLA. And there's another one called fast PM and that can be used uh, for this uh, type of things. There's another type of, I wouldn't even call simulations because it's not really a simulation, called log normal realizations. So what is this log normal realization? This log normal realization is, uh, is a way in which you input uh, some summary statistics and this log normalizations will do what, whatever, what is exactly what he's saying. It will generate uh, random log normal realizations uh, of this that reproduces on average the input summary, that reproduces the input summary statistics. So it's not an n body simulation. And, uh, and there, the latest one is, uh, well, the first one was Flask, and uh, there is a more recent one it's called Glass. It's generator for large scale structures. So this is not very precise. But it uh, can be useful for if you want to have a, a lot of simulations very fast if you know the summary statistics already. So this is, this is interesting for testing covariance matrices and stuff. And now, now I, I, want to, I want to ask you guys a question. This, and this is an interesting question. You have been told <laughs> that the fluctuations in perturbation are Gaussian, right? So delta has, is, a Gaussian, is a random variable of a Gaussian distribution. So let me ask you this. So delta, remember that delta is the density row at a certain point in a certain time divided 
sorry, minus the average density divided by the average density. Right? So let me ask you this. What is the minimum value that delta can have? Minus one. How can it be Gaussian? <laughs> it's not Gaussian. Of course, if you, are, if you have small deltas, etc., Gaussian is very good approximation. 10 to the minus 5, fine. If you are in large perturbations, you cannot use Gaussian. And that's why people use log normal realizations instead of normal realizations. Okay? <laughs> so, um, right. So, this is the reason. Okay. And then another uh, 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 technique that has become very uh, popular and important um, is emulators, which is a kind of a fit. But <laughs> I guess emulator is a fit, right? It's a fancier name for an, a fit. It's an emulator. What is an emulator? So again, it's a, you, you, have, you, you can generate a, a, a suite of n-body simulations. And uh, with this suite of n-body simulations, each one for different cosmological parameters, you, you make these emulators. Okay. So these emulators can be fast, and they can provide uh, 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 the results for the nonlinear power spectrum based on, a, on the suite of simulations for, for a given model, and then different parameters of that model. And uh, I guess. One of the famous examples is the uh, Euclid emulator, a recent emulator, which they claim, again, I'm not involved in this, so they claim a percent level accurate emulation supported in the eight dimensional parameter space of W0, WA. Now you know what W0, WA is, right? Remember what W0, WA is? A parameterization of the equation of state of dark energy. So this is the next next simplest model that I mentioned. W0, WA, CDM, plus some uh, neutrino mass models. Between redshift 0 and 3.5, uh, sorry, 0 and 3, for uh, uh, scales between 0.01 to 10 inverse megaparsecs. That's amazing. And this is based, now it's not uh, 16, <laughs> it's based on more than 250 high resolution uh, simulation. All right, so this is, uh, these are ways to go beyond the linear perturbation theory. These are, just to summarize, these are based on n-body simulations, and this is for dark matter only. But it's for a given model, and this suite of simulations, they have to be representative of, this, uh, of different parameters in, for, for a given model. In this case, W0, WACDM. And then, there are also some analytical methods that try to go beyond the simplest linear perturbation theory. And that includes higher order perturbation theory and also something called effective field theory, which we will hear a lot next week from Marco and Matthias. Okay? So uh, I, I think there's a consensus that they're limited to 0.5 uh, inverse megaparsecs. So they cannot go to two, two small scales. And there's a large body of work on this. So there are codes such as class PT, fast PT, uh, that computes these cosmological um, um, perturbations. So there's a, there's a way of calculating higher order corrections, just like you do in quantum field theory with Feynman diagrams. So there's a, it's the same, it's not, it's not field theory, okay? it's a classical theory. But there's a way to put this language of computing higher order corrections in the language of field theory, with uh, diagrams, etc. So, so, um, so people compute this at uh, one loop, two loops, etc. And uh, so again, there's fast PT and class PT that can compute this um, 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 can compute the uh, power spectrum going to higher order in perturbation theory. Okay, these are two things. And this is again using this uh, uh, um, cosmo cosmology, cosmological core library. Uh, it's easy to plot uh, what is the power spectrum 
uh, again, this is the blue line is the linear power spectrum, and the red line is the nonlinear matter power spectrum using halo fit. Right? So you see that, uh, as Mustafa was saying, that if you look at large scales, sorry, just to finish this, at large scales, perturbation theory works well, the linear power spectrum works well, but then it starts to deviate uh, from, the linear, uh, from the linear power spectrum. And before you ask the question, I ask the question. <laughs> so why, why do you think that the, there is a, the, the, there's this, the shift is upwards? Why there's an enhancement in power at small scales? I asked first. <laughs> <laughs> yes. 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 This is real. so. We have to make the translation between real space and redshift space, and uh, if. There, there are ways of doing that. There's something called redshift space distortions, but there, is there are ways of doing this. Okay? So this is, but this is all theoretical. So this is, a, this is in real space. So who can answer why, why there's an enhancement? Yes. Yes, the perturbations, they grow more at small scales. That's, that's the reason. That's the answer. Okay, why? Because at small scales, you have more matter falling in. Perturbations are more nonlinear, and then you get this uh, enhancement. It's a self, you know, it's the rich getting richer, let's say. <laughs> so that's why you have this enhancement here. So the nonlinear effect is to enhance, to enhance the power spectrum. Okay? And this is from Halo Fit. You can do this with, of course, or the emulators, whatever. The result is not very different. Of course, the problem is nowadays we need precision in cosmology. So, uh, so what I'm doing here is absolutely not precise, but just to give an idea. So this at z equals zero. So I have another plot, I think. This is the same plot as this, but the only difference is the redshift. So who, what, who can explain to me what is happening here? Exactly. Exactly. So if you go further back in the history of the universe, the perturbations did not have time to grow too much. So the linear approximation is much better. It works better. It works at, uh, to a smaller scale. So this one starts to deviate very little at, uh, you know, five, five-ish mega, inverse megaparsecs. So this is an important effect. And uh, Mustafa mentioned Lyman alpha. So this is a way, it's a tracer of, uh, of dark matter that can be used to test large-scale structure, which is at a high redshift. And that's why this is an interesting tracer, because, you know, linear perturbation theory works better. Now, can you imagine this at z equals 1,000? Boom! <laughs> works fantastic. <laughs> right? N to the minus 5. Everything works great. So, yes. Okay. So, what is the bottom line of this? So, for simple cosmological models, there are already fast emulators that you can find in the market, like the Euclid emulator, for instance, or W0, WA. Emulators are even being developed for more complex models using neural networks. And one example is something called the Cosmo Power. That's something that came up two years ago, something. There's some recent work on beyond Lambda CDM cosmologies with uh, this COLA fast simulation. And I know, uh, uh, there, I know two papers on that. There, of course, there are more. So this is, there's a paper on enabling matter power spectrum emulation beyond Lambda CDM models with Cola, and then there's something called the high cola. Um, so high, high. This high comes from high, uh, from the uh, Hondesky thing, you know. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I, modify gravity. 
I don't know why it's called Hive. Is it? Uh, it's Hordesky. My, but where's the I comes from? <laughs> it's Hord. Ah, it's H in the beginning and E in the end. Yeah, could be. Yeah. <laughs> There's some modified gravity models, very complicated, that only very smart people like Diana and uh, Susanna work on. <laughs> oh, I'm kidding. Uh, called uh, uh, called um, Hordesky models. It's a modified gravity model. And then there are, there are um, emulators trying to um, emulate the Hordesky gravity. OK, and uh, now, the nonlinear predictions for the matter power spectrum of lambda CDM and beyond are really fundamental if you want to use the full data set that we have in the service. So that's what I mentioned. If you don't understand the nonlinear matter power spectrum, we cannot use the data. As simple as that. Okay? Cannot use the data. So this is important. This will come back uh, next lecture tomorrow. So now I'm going to the next uh, challenge. So before going to the next challenge, is there any uh, questions about the this challenge that uh, we have? Yes. <laughs> yes. So so the simulations are used to make the emulators. So we have to make a suite of, of, uh, of simulations, each one with different parameters. But you have to pick a model. It has to be one model. Pick a model, change all the parameters. You have uh, six parameters, make a grid. You know, I don't know how many, parameter, how many parameters, you, how many uh, points in the grid you have. And then you have simulations for all these different models. And then you try to build something that uh, interpolates between these so you measure the power spectrum in each one, and then you build something that interpolates among these different uh, simulations. Okay? It's for n-body simulations, matter, matter power spectrum. All right? Yes? Why a higher redshift? Yes. Yes, yes, absolutely, yes, yes. So the things that at higher redshift, the um, uh, perturbations had less time to grow. So there's still more in the linear regime. That's the reason. OK? Good. More questions? OK, so let's go to baryons. So this is the second challenge I want to talk about, baryons. And uh, <laughs> I used to say that. Uh, um, the universe would be much simpler if we are not around. <laughs> unfortunately, we are around. <laughs> well, not unfortunately, but we are around to ask questions about the universe. So we are baryons, and uh, baryons are complicated. We are complicated things, not because we are baryons, but we are complicated. Uh, so baryons, what, what, what's the problem with baryons? So they experience dissipative uh, electromagnetic processes. And so they, call, they, they tend to clump, form structures uh, by dissipation. They can, they can form stars, for instance. And then, and then stars can explode, right? Supernovas can explode. Uh, and imagine that you, you have some structure wanting, wanting to collapse. And then all of a sudden, there is a supernova in the middle that explodes. What happens? You know, this explosion will kind of uh, stop the process of uh, structure formation, because it's taking stuff out. Also, uh, active galactic nuclei have this tendency of having jets ejected that can also stop or at least uh, and, um, slow structure formation. And this is called baryonic feedback. And uh, some people call this gastrophysics. That's another name that you'll probably hear about. Gas from gas, astrophysics, gastrophysics. <laughs> yeah, people call this gastrophysics sometimes. I think by the feedback is better. Uh, so what happens is that if you go at scales where you have supernovas and, and uh, AGNs, you, you have um, uh, suppression in the matter power spectrum. How to study this? This is really complicated and you need simulations. And someone asked about um, simulations that takes, takes into account this um, uh, fluid dynamics. And, and, and these simulations are very, 
very computing uh, intensive, but they have been done. There are very famous simulations, the Millennium simulation, the Eagle simulation, you can look it up. It's amazing, those simulations are amazing. They reproduce galaxies. You look at those simulations, you can see galaxies. It's, it's truly incredible. So, but uh, you, you need the simulations to take into account uh, all these process simulations have to be very detailed, etc. You know? But these simulations, they are very hard to do, and also they have parameters. So there are uncertainties in the simulations as well. And, and one, uh, this code, AGM code, also has parameters that try to reproduce what baryons can do in a very phenomenological way. And you can use this uh, AGM code to fit also for baryonic effects. And uh, this is one way that uh, we are doing this in large-scale surveys. Now, uh, one thing that would be interesting is to study techniques to mitigate the uncertainties in baryon physics. And I show you something because uh, I, I did some work on that. Uh, this plot doesn't show very well, but what this plot shows is the ratio be between a hydrodynamic simulation to a dark matter-only simulation of the power spectrum as a function of k. So if this is close to one, it means that uh, the hydro simulation and dark matter only simulation are very similar. But uh, when you go to large k, small scales, they start to differ, right? So, um, so this includes, of course, the nonlinear uh, behavior, which means that, um, uh, I'm sorry, that these are the uh, suppression due to baryon physics, and then it increases due to nonlinear behavior. And what you see in this plot are 14 different simulations. And you see that they're, they're not the same. They, 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 dif they differ, right? There are some uncertainties here of the other even 20%. So um, we, we, uh, there was, uh, I had a master's student that uh, uh, looked at this and uh, tried to um, um, parameterize the uncertainty due to this baryonic that can be seen from this, can be inferred from these baryonic simulations uh, into some uncertainty that you can add to a covariance matrix, to the error matrix that you use in the, um, in the uh, theoretical analysis. And um, I think we are successful, but uh, this has not been used <laughs> yet. Um, okay, so this is just to show that there are uncertainties, even if you do the simulations. Yes. So, um it's not true for all the curves. For example, the red one is always either one or above. But what I see that there's a trend that in the intermediate case, most of them the ratios are lower than one. And if you go to higher one, most of them are higher than one. So what's the reason that in the intermediate scale the disagreement happens that the ratios are lower than one and later on higher than one? Is there a specific reason why it behaves like that? Yeah, I, I, I don't know. So there are many parameters in each simulation, but what I what I think is that these suppressions here that you see is because of the baryon feedback. And then when you go to even smaller scales, it's the nonlinear non effects be, uh, get over the uh, baryonic effect. But you're right, there's one that uh, does not go down. <laughs> this one, right? And uh, I don't know, this is MB2, so massive, black, whatever it's called. But the simulations are very difficult and they have parameters as well. Okay, three parameters. So, so we don't know how to take this into account. Usually what we do in DS is take just one of them. Which one? The, we don't know. Uh, they, we took the owl simulation. Where's the owl? Do you see the owl? It's not here? Maybe it's not here. <laughs> so we took another simulation as a reference, and then we see until what point we can reproduce with our, with our theoretical modeling, uh, the power spectrum, and then, and then we decide whether or not to take that into account. Okay, so this is baryons, okay? So there's no linear effects, there's baryon effects. And finally, the third challenge. Really? That was fast. <laughs> the third challenge is the connection between matter and galaxy. Because all we have done so far is to look at the matter power spectrum. But we don't see the matter power spectrum. We see galaxies. So... What is the what is the problem? This is this is exemplifying this map. Suppose you're looking at the map of the Earth, and you just look at light. 
So you see that there are concentrations of light in some places, but the matter is underlying all of this, right? There is, of course, there's ocean here too. So, so suppose the, the uh, light is where galaxies are. So what is the relation between galaxies and the dark matter? No? Where, so uh, how do we do this? So we have to find a connection between galaxies and, uh, and the dark matter. And this is called galaxy bias. The name is galaxy bias. So how do we do that? So we want to connect the perturbations in galaxies. So in dark energy survey, we see galaxies everywhere. And then we take a region of space and compute the, uh, uh, how many galaxies are there. And, uh, and this is a perturbation of it over an average of the galaxies that we see. So we see everything is galaxies. We don't see dark matter. But uh, galaxies, they, uh, they form in regions where the matter density is, in quotation marks, large enough. So what is meant by large enough? I can be more precise, um, but I will not. <laughs> but they can be defined in models such as spherical collapse, etc. And also, you can understand that the galaxy bias depends on redshift, because the, the dark matter perturbations are smaller if you go at higher redshift, and if you have a galaxy there, and the galaxy needs a concentration of dark matter to form, the this fluctuation dark matter has to be much larger. So the bias should increase with redshift. And we actually saw that. So, yes. So, uh, uh, and, and also the galaxy bias depends on what galaxy type you're talking about. If it's a quasar, for instance, or a red giant, or etc. So it's a complicated business. Now, what is the simplest model you can imagine? <laughs> the simplest model, and of course we always start the simplest model, is what is called a linear bias. It's just say that there is a linear relation between galaxies, the perturbations in galaxies, and perturbation in dark matter. And this is called the B1, sometimes only B, which can be a function of redshift. So that's what we're doing. I'm talking about dark energy survey more next time. So, <laughs> Just a spoiler, we tested different models of bias, but for the dark energy survey, the third year, uh, the linear bias was sufficient. Now, how do we go beyond this very simple approximation? So there are two main approaches to go beyond this very simple approximation. The one is a very phenomenological approach, which is based on, a, on something called a halo occupation distribution model uh, and combined with a halo mass function. So I just say in words what this, uh, what this phenom phenomenological model is. So remember that from the dark matter simulations, we can have an idea of the dark matter halos that are formed, the amount of dark matter that forms some structures, we call halos. So from that, we can estimate how many halos are there with a given mass, and this is called the halo mass function. And then what we can do is that given a halo of dark matter, we can have a phenomenological model on how galaxies would be distributed in that halo. And that's called a halo occupation distribution model. Totally phenomenological, so there are three parameters, and you can use that you know, and fit with the data and have, a, uh, and, uh, and have results for, for, the, uh, for the model as well. This is a way of, of, of doing this, okay? Um, and then there's another way, which I would call more principal models, which are based on effective theory expansions. And this is something you hear again next week uh, from Marco. Uh, and these are using operators that are allowed by symmetries to expand the bias. It's called bias expansion. I think I have only one slide on that, and I, I don't want to go through this. I think Marco will do it. But it's a, a relation between the galaxy bias and the dark matter Sorry, the galaxy density perturbation, the dark matter density perturbation is much more complicated. This is the linear bias that we just mentioned. You, you can have quadratic bias, and you can have things that depend on something called the tidal, uh, uh, tidal bias, non-local bias, which is a Laplacian of delta M, plus some stochastic bias, etc. And uh, in fact, uh, very recently, there's a paper uh, from the LSST, which was, uh, was this is, uh, informally, inside the collaboration, it's called the Bias Challenge paper, which uh, looked at different models for galaxy bias to see which one describes better um, the simulations. Yes? Um, so, 
So in the linear bias case, when you said it was sufficient, yes, yes, yes. Okay. And it still ended up being not degenerate with the fact that the growth function and the transfer function are all amplitude. Exactly, there are loss of degeneracies. Okay. Um, and we have to take that into account. Yes. So, okay. so the biases are uh, um, degenerate with the. Uh, Amplitude of the initial power spectrum, yeah. right? Yeah. But uh, but we combine. That's that's very good because in DS we not only look at galaxy clustering, mm -hmm. we also look at galaxy weak lensing, oh, okay. and the weak lensing is bias independent. Oh, okay. it's fantastic. So we can break the the, the degeneracies with this. Okay. Could we, could we not also use the fact that the bias so so uh, so what we do is to allow the bias I tell you this tomorrow okay. but we allow the bias to vary uh, in each redshift beam that we're looking at okay. so so we have more than one nuisance parameters okay. we have uh, five because we have five beams but this is good yes exactly that's exactly what we do No, we just consider one uh, bias because we're just looking at some, uh, um, we have some color cuts to select the galaxies and that's it. And then just one, one bias. So we're not looking at quasars, for instance, and things like that. So this will come tomorrow. And I have two minutes. Give or take. Okay, so... Um, Right, so there's a, uh, you can do what is called, uh, you, can, you can compute the power spectrum, the galaxy, galaxy power, so, so the galaxy, galaxy power spectrum. You can compute the galaxy, galaxy power spectrum in terms of uh, the power spectrum, of not, not only, not matter, but also you have to compute, for instance, right, uh, if you want to compute this uh, expansion in bias, you have to compute the correlation between, just on a, as a, one example, of the matter fluctuation and the Laplacian of the matter fluctuation. This will be one term in this expansion. Okay? Understand? The, is it clear? No, it's not clear. Because you have this different sets of, of uh, operators. So for instance, you have to compute delta m with delta m squared if you want to compute uh, uh, the term B12. So it's much more complicated and uh, more recently, there's, uh, there are codes that uh, can implement this type of expansion. So this FASTPT code can do it. And uh, ah, I didn't say that. <laughs> I, maybe I should. There are two ways of doing fluid dynamics. One is called Eulerian, and the other is called Lagrangian. The Eulerian is when the fluid is passing by you. And the Lagrangian is when you are co-moving with the fluid. <laughs> Basically, it's that. Okay, and uh, so you can do Lagrangian coordinates or Eulerian coordinates, and uh, next week you'll be all cleared up about this, I hope, <laughs> or more confused. Anyway, so there's a Lagrangian expansion that was implemented in a code called uh, Velociraptors. Don't, yes, don't uh, ask me why it's called Velociraptors. <laughs> it's called Velociraptors. And then even more recently, there's a hybrid effective field theory including results from antibody simulations, uh, and it's called ANZU. And I just put here because it's a former student of mine that uh, was involved in development of this. So it's a code for cosmology dependence on hybrid FT spectrum. And they claim that the, they are 1% accurate up to 0.6 inverse megaparsecs. And actually, uh, so I'm, this is a, a, a master student of mine, and uh, this is a former student of mine, just finished his PhD at Stanford, actually, and he's going to IAS. Um, and uh, so we are trying to include uh, the, um, some uncertainties, and this is the uh, galaxy matter power spectrum, so it's not galaxy gas, it's galaxy matter because of the uh, weak lensing. And you can see the uncertainties uh, at, um, at uh, small scales, that comes from the varying the, bi the bias parameters. So we want to include these uncertainties again in the covariance matrix to see if we can mitigate the uh, uncertainties in bias. Okay, so I think I, I, I went too slow today, I'm sorry. And uh, I, I think I have to skip, I, I, I don't have time, right, for doing this. I start next time with this uh, 
survey of surveys. <laughs> the survey of uh, large galaxy surveys. Okay, thank you. It was a very light lecture, no? Everything, because it was content-free, basically. <laughs> now we have the post. Uh, yes. Uh, and, and reception. Uh, and reception. Don't be. <laughs> <laughs>